there were always inspectors around to make sure that the job was being done properly. In undulating ground and wherever the line changed direction, individual joints had to be bent to fit the contours of the ditch. Just ahead of the welders, men with emery wheels powered by portable motors cleaned the beveled pipe ends to ready them for welding. A side boom tractor picked up each joint and brought it into alignment with the one behind it, while a control rod attached to an internal clamp was threaded through. The clamp was maneuvered so as to grip and hold the two abutting pipe ends. A stringer bead was now applied to the joint. This was a critical operation, calling for sureness of touch combined with speed. Once the two ends had been linked by the stringer bead, the internal clamp was released and the next joint of pipe was brought into position. While the lineup men moved forward, hot pass welders put more metal over the stringer bead. Then came the firing line, a team of follow-up welders and their helpers who made two additional passes around each seam. The individual joints were literally blended together into a continuous tube, strong enough to carry oil at pressures from 500 to 1,100 pounds to the square inch, with plenty of strength to spare. To help maintain a uniformly high standard of welding, teams of X-ray technicians kept just behind the welders, photographing a representative number of seams. Practiced eyes scanned the film strips, and if any harmful irregularity or defect were revealed, a weld would have to be repaired or a new one made. The pipeliners took small streams in their stride. The pipe would later be buried well below the stream bed. Mobile construction equipment waded right across rivers that weren't too deep, without any snorkel attachments either. After the welders had done their work on the line, a self-propelled machine supported by a side boom tractor cleaned rust and scale off the surface of the steel with a battery of cutters and painted it with a primer. Behind the cleaning and priming machine came another self-propelled and still more complicated piece of mechanism. This was the coat and wrap machine. It performed several functions at once. It flooded the surface of the pipe with coal tar enamel at a temperature of 475 degrees, fed through a hose from a traveling kettle. Then it embedded glass floss in the coating for reinforcement, and finally wrapped the pipe in asbestos felt. Thus, the pipeline was protected from corrosion underground. Among the Rockies, in the vicinity of Jasper National Park, which is a game preserve, the pipeliners were often followed by volunteer scavengers. Discarded sandwiches and other food scraps were never wasted. Continuous sections of pipe as long as 4,000 feet were dealt with at a time where the terrain permitted. For tie-ins, the welders used external line-up plants. Then the sections were welded together or tied in. Wherever a tie-in was made and wherever the insulation was bruised or incomplete, the pipe was generously doused with hot coal tar and wrapped by hand. The next step was to lower the pipe into its trench. The big tractors with their side booms gripped and held the pipe aloft in wide slings. Then on signals from the foreman, the operators eased the line down into its prepared bed. Great care and skill were needed for this operation, which had to be done under a variety of conditions. Now a top padding of soft earth was put over the pipe to protect its wrapping. 
Finally, a tractor with a handy dragline rig backfilled the trench. An important aftermath was the cleaning up operation. Fences were replaced wherever they intersected the right of way. In a short while, a new growth of vegetation would hide all trace of the pipeline lying silently 30 inches below the surface. During the fall of 1952, five separate spreads or outfits of pipeliners were hard at work. Three between Kamloops and Jasper, a fourth near Edmonton, and a fifth in the Fraser River Valley near Vancouver. At the peak of the season's operations, the pipeliners finished three miles a day. And before they were forced by winter rain, snow, and frost to stop laying pipe for the season, they had filled in nearly half the total distance between Edmonton and Vancouver. But work in other branches of the project went on apace. The great tank farm at Burnaby, near Vancouver, had been cleared and graded during the summer and fall. In January 1953, steel for the first of its 150,000 barrel storage tanks was delivered and laid down in spite of rain and mud. The Burnaby tanks, with a capacity in excess of a million barrels, were being erected by Horton Steelworks Limited. In only a short while, the floor was laid. A floating roof was placed on top of it and the walls were taking shape. Still another tank was rising on the Burnaby hillside. One after another, its great steel plates were hoisted into position. The vertical welding was done by hand. But the horizontal welding was speeded up by an automatic machine that moves steadily along, making a uniform weld of a strength equal to that of the plates themselves. And storage tanks were being erected and welded at Edmonton at the same time by Toronto Ironworks Limited. On a hill near Kamloops, bulldozers were grading right away for spring pipe lane. They were approaching the highest point on the entire line, a plateau southwest of Kamloops with an elevation of 4,000 feet. From there on, it would be downhill. About two-thirds of the way from Edmonton to Vancouver, the city of Kamloops, right on the pipeline route, lies at the confluence of the North Thompson with the main river, just above Kamloops Lake. The landscape around Kamloops underwent a sharp change from summer to winter. In January, it was blanketed in snow and mist. On the outskirts of Kamloops, pipeline equipment lay in a storage yard awaiting reconditioning for its next season's work. But on the nearby banks of the Thompson, there was great activity. Its insulation protected by wooden slats and ringed with concrete weights, a section of pipeline was pulled across the river. A trench for the pipe at the river bottom was made by a suction dredge working in newly formed ice. The dredge had a small pipeline of its own to carry the sand and silt to shore. Taking advantage of low water, the pipeliners were installing a number of river crossings during the winter. In the Vancouver area, where the weather was mild but moist, preparations were made by Missouri Valley Canadian Limited for the greatest of all the 98 stream and river crossings on the project. Pipe sections two feet in diameter and a half inch thick which had previously been triple-coated and triple-wrapped for corrosion protection, were now sprayed with a concrete mixture over reinforcing mesh. The pipe was next welded together in two long strings so that the bulk of the line could be pulled right across the river.